I'd like to uh, get to start uh, with who I am. Uh, my name is Mark Island, uh, and I talk a lot about shit. Um, occasionally I do talk shit, but sometimes I actually talk about shit. Uh, so, moving on. Myself, my position is normally here with a copy of The Economist. I get the weekly subscription for a year, right? And then it comes in by the side, I've got this nice little desk, and I just sit down and I do it. Okay? Uh, who washes their hands after going to the toilet? Audience participation time. No, seriously, guys, who washes their hands? Okay. Uh, so, some statistics for you. Uh, two and a half billion people on the planet do not wash their hands after going to the toilet because they do not have improved sanitary facilities. That guy just there is doing open defecation, defecating in the open. So no toilet, you know, not really. He's outside, people can see him, there's no privacy. You don't necessarily get eaten by a Tyrannosaurus rex, but you're still defecating in the open. 1.3 billion people do that. We're not talking about the crisis that you have with malaria or any of those, or cholera or typhoid. You know, these are cases that happen after. Because, you know, when you're defecating in the open, where's it going to go? Right? Flood tables, box standard GIS, modeling. You know, literally box standard. I like puns. Um, so, Um, this is a place uh, that I talk about quite a bit, uh, and it's something that's quite dear to my heart. And really, it's one of the things that I love about open source uh, and open street map in particular. It's a place called Tandali in Dar es Salaam. It's a place of contrasts, really. Um, it's got about 100,000 people living there, and it's about two kilometres square. You know, it's relatively sizable. Um, it's about half the size of Hyde Park in London. Um, there's, well, we did a bit of mapping over three weeks. Um, we took some university students, uh, 20 university students, about 20 community members. Uh, they were trained in how to use a GPS, how to use OpenStreetMap, that sort of methodology, because there's no spatial data in developing nations pretty much. Your national mapping agencies don't necessarily keep your data up to date. So if you want data, you've got to collect it yourself. One of the things that were interested in were toilets. For 100,000 people, there were 93 toilets. These weren't flushable toilets either. But, you know, these weren't things with a formal sewage system. These were holes in the ground that people would go in. And that's what you paid for. If you weren't, then you would just sort of go out into the world and you know find out where you go, where you want to go. And now we're looking at this because you know, when we look at the economic performance of nations, you know, a lot of that is on the health. Now if 20% of your country is suffering from cholera, typhoid, and malaria on a daily basis, that's a lot of your workforce that isn't able to work, which isn't able to contribute to your economy. So it's a massive drain on that country's natural resources for you know, the public themselves. Um, and because it's not a web camp without Gary Gale, here is Gary Gale. Hey, yeah. Okay. Hi there, uh, my name is Mark Eilef. I'm Gary, Gary Gale. And um, you may have seen us previously having a lot of geo beers and geo bukas. In places su such as Amsterdam, Palo Alto, Berlin. Berlin. The wear camps, yeah. Also the W3Gs and the geo communities amongst us. But today we're a bit, well, we're just somewhere a bit different. 
It's my first time in Africa and we're here in, in Tandali on the outskirts of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. And where we're at at the moment, we're on the border of uh, a subward, uh, well two subwards actually. One's called Pakacha and the other's called Moatani. And um, basically we're in an open defecation area and a dumping area. And as you can see here, um, there's a river that's running through it that's been blocked. And uh, there's a lot of bubbling going on, a lot of nitration. And, uh, well, those are the technical words. The, um, a video and sounds alone ca cannot convey what it's like to, to stand here. It's round about 34 degrees. Uh, the sun is overhead and is beating down and there are just waves and waves of smell coming off of this beside me. It, it's, it's, it's incredible, it almost overwhelms you. Yeah, um, and that's not mentioning the, um, the mosquitoes. Um, and unfortunately, you know, people are building on this. I mean, there's development going on. Uh, there are children playing. Uh, yeah. And this, 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 is, this is a place of utter contrasts. Um, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a geotechnologist and a, and a geographer for, for my day job. I make stuff with maps. But the stuff that we make with maps kind of pales into insignificance compared with the impact that mapping this area can have. It, 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 I can't stress this enough. But, and also what I can't stress enough is despite all of this, the warmth and the welcome that we have had here has just been absolutely overwhelming. Um, the people here are just marvellous and inspiring. And uh, so really, everywhere you go, it's just you know, mambo, caribou, you know, welcome. And it and, is. The, yeah. the welcome is is phenomenal. Yeah. That's all I have to say, really. I'm, I'm, I'm shell-shocked by all of this. Um, this doesn't happen to me very often, but I don't really think I can say any more either. We're done. Okay. What I'll do for the sake of time is move on from here and I'll post a tweet later. I wouldn't ever let everyone have a look at the video because he's a guy that has spent pretty much all his life working rather aptly uh, in the developed world, creating geosystems and geostacks. He's never been to a place like that before, and he just got off the plane within four hours, had a camera shoved in front of his face, and was basically said, okay, what do you think? And it's quite a good viewpoint for people that have never seen that sort of environment before, because it is a constantly changing, constantly evolving environment. Now, because of the uh, refugee status, which is going on at the moment in the Congo, and also in Somalia, we're seeing a lot of people moving south through Kenya and Tanzania. Now, there are, you know, where are they going to go? They're going to move to the urban cities. And you know, a lot of these cities have formal, um, formal structures, formal housing, which these people don't necessarily have access to. So they will go to the places where, which are unplanned, which are formal. Now, the only places where you can actually build on these areas are over defecation areas, waste dumping areas. And effectively, they're cannibalized for people to build their houses on. Yeah, this is a severe issue. And, you know, here are some statistics, and really, I don't really think they're acceptable. From a basic human point, there's, uh, you know, personally, I'm a researcher, I'm uh, studying for a PhD. Uh, I also uh, work for the Global ICT Unit at the World Bank. You know, there are other motivations, but I don't think it is acceptable for people to be living in this situation. And I think it's something that, you know, there is a global responsibility for. Uh, and this is not on a high horse, it, it's just a matter of fact. Right? Um, and actually, we've got the great opportunity, because we do have open software. We've got open source. Uh, we've got, you know, large companies which are engaging, and instead of paying for sort of people licenses, they're actually saying, okay, well, how do we help solve this problem? Yeah. I don't want to say that it's fertile ground, but there is a lot of opportunity here, especially with standards. So the interplay of information and data is coming in as well. Um, also, um, points on a map is good, but sometimes it's not great. Uh, and there are things out there uh, which do provide points on a map. 
which provides specific things. Now, in this space, especially in the humanitarian one, Ushahidi has been leading uh, quite a lot. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Ushahidi came out in 2007 as a crisis map uh, of the Kenny riots. And um, you know, it's developed uh, by uh, people in Nairobi, in Kenya. And you know, people have looked at it and thought, well, you know, how do we use this and develop uh, systems around it? But when you're dealing with infrastructure, uh, and essentially the lack of infrastructure, that doesn't map well to a point on that. You're more interested in facilities, you're interested in areas. And those facilities may be point based, but they may be polygon based, or they may not exist at all. You may be working a vernacular bounding of the activity, which is constantly changing and constantly in flux. Because even though you have hard administrative boundaries in the developed world, your administrative boundaries in Tanzania and in Barcelona can be rapidly evolving because the city is growing at a phenomenal rate. You know, five years ago, three million people, now three and a half million people. That level of population growth, you, know, you can't just keep up with it. And having uh, traditional structures as your census bureau, and so, well, you know, how do we keep, how do we map this growth? We don't have the resources to look after it, but it's accelerating, not the growth. <coughs> um, and really, software is the easy bit here. The hard bit is actually getting into uh, into systems like that. And really, oh, no, you fucking use it. If someone is going to be defecating in the open, creating a, creating a tool which allows them to say on my iPhone that I've just defecated in the open is going to be pretty useless. Because they don't have an iPhone. The reason they don't have an iPhone is because they go to the toilet in a field somewhere. Making a smartphone app isn't going to work. Potentially, SMS-based is a potential solution. But, how are you going to geolocate that? Yeah. So how are you going to create tools and systems to support that? You know, we talk about user-centric design. What happens if the user is not articulate and is just surviving? You know, how do you create tools for that? And that's something I think that really needs to be addressed. In this <coughs> um, so going back to our opportunity, We've got open data, we've got open platforms. Sorry, I quite like Star Trek. And, um, you know, with our data, with our open data cap, how do we stick it on a platform or an enterprise? I thought it was funny. Um, for it to go and for it to work. And part of that is uh, Tarifa. Um, Tarifa was started as a software platform. We made a mistake we thought we could solve the problem by thinking, well, we can just do it. We can create technology and solve this problem. And it's quite naive to think like that. Um, and, well, what we thought was if we can create a platform which can triage reports, not just the issue of a single point, but where it's tagging to infrastructure. Where you're looking at it and saying, well, this is my map. What I'm going to do is I'm going to click here on this toilet. I'm just going to say, right, what's broken? Is it the tap that's broken? Is it the bowl? Uh, is the system gone? Give a description. Then you can have a history so you can catalog issues. And then maybe you create an interface for the government, which gives them an ability to see how much it's going to cost per problem. So you can build up a model of how much it's going to cost to fix the issues that are occurring with their own infrastructure. Again, the technology is the easy thing. Because Had was uh, we developed with some hackers at the hackathon. There was the London Water Hackathon in 2011. A group of hackers got together 
Well, we decided to create a solution. We forked Bushahini. We created a triage and a tasking server for it. We started to look at open standards, like the 311 Civic Tracking Standard, for the assessment and movement of reports in and out. Um, we deployed it in Uganda. And, um, you know, we took coke and beer and wine to map those problems. We're trying to build that bridge now. And within the Uganda use case, which is quite similar to this, we had uh, 1,700 reports within the Ministry of Local Government on a system that was hacked together for about $200 by people who were at a, uh, a hackathon event. And we stayed together as a community. But that doesn't solve the problems. And the main message from my talk today is if we want to solve problems like this and to map open defecation, we need to think seriously about the types of platforms that we develop. Because you can have uh, you know, things using the 311 standard like my society, like Fix My Street, like Tarifa. And there is a great opportunity there for people. But unless we look at the uh, social impact of the technology, we're just going to be as useful as the guy getting eaten by the T Rex because actually we're not going to make any difference at all. Now, the thing within uh, Tarifa as an open source platform is that we know this and we're making steps towards it. We're not driven by ego and we want to work forward. So if anyone's got any ideas, or if anyone wants to help out, I'd really like to talk to you again. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> Question Oh, and if anyone wants to see a UAV in one of the times of our splurge, times of R&D, I'd like to point you towards Ian. How do you fund the river? Well, why would you like to fund it? So, we deployed with the African Urban Unit of the World Bank in Uganda. Uh, we've had about 1,700 reports so far. We're now deployed in Zimbabwe and Ghana. We've had $200 worth of funding uh, from the International <laughs> Conference of Crisis Mappers because we came second to UNHCR. How we'd like to fund it is um, well, two ways. One, creating a better business model for us. So this has to be sustainable in country. It can't be funded purely by grant because when the grant money runs out, yeah, it's it's over. If you can build a model where the software is supporting almost naturally, great. Um, not that we wouldn't accept grant money uh, if anyone is wanting to fund a project. Um, secondly, it's about building skills within the local country as well. And you know, we're looking at the tech field now in terms of, of working with them, and they will contribute to the software and hopefully have an exchange, as a, well, an exchange in the partnership where we can leverage humanitarian developers within the United States to build skills up over there. And that could be funded through donations or through sponsorship. Uh, but it is something that we're working with, uh, with quite a few most people. Like to get this is just like well, thank you very much. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, do you have any contact with the I mean the actually using financials financial uh, bodies? Um, professionally, um, I've spoken with uh, the IFCAR Health Institute in Tanzania. Sorry? Uh, the IFCAR Health Institute in Tanzania. Mm. Um, however, one of the issues that we faced uh, with that field has been siloing of data. And I wouldn't necessarily say the willingness, the willingness to collaborate, but more in the sense that they're not where we are technologically. And that's a problem for everyone involved because we need to learn how to speak their language. 
and I think technologically there's a mismatch because when we spoke to them, they're about well, how do we procure this technology? It's a Tanzanian body for health generally. And that's the, that you've showed us the, the CDC in the United States, the Center for Disease Prevention in the yeah. United States, we have in Europe, so maybe there could be some other. <coughs> um, yeah, well, if you've got any connection to the hotel. Okay. <laughs> okay. 